when leaders are cynical, they'll institute practices that really display a low level of trust and low level of faith in the people in their organization. A lot of companies installed spyware on their employees' computers to like make sure that their, their faces were on camera or their mouses were moving. And that type of organizational cynicism from leaders quickly spreads through all of their employees. All right. Well, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. I'm very curious, what piqued your interest in researching cynicism? Uh, well, uh, it would actually be my own experience. You know, I've spent 20 years studying, I guess you could say human goodness. So my lab and I study things like empathy, compassion, kindness, togetherness. And through that work, I've sort of become a little bit of an ambassador for those positive qualities. People bring me in to talk about how great everybody is. And this whole time, AJ, I've lived with a little bit of a secret, which is that even though I know what my data tell me, I believe that people are really oriented towards each other and are really kind and wonderful. I don't always feel that. And in fact, for a long time, I've secretly been pretty cynical about people myself. So this book began as my attempt to explore why the heck I couldn't get on board with my own science and, and grew into much more than that. Well, I know you mentioned in the book that you're an introvert. Do you feel that your introversion played a role in the cynicism? I would say it's almost the other way around. Uh, you know, for, for me, not for all introverts, but I think for a lot of people who shy away from others, it's because we kind of have this implicit theory that other people won't like us very much, or maybe that they're, that conversations will go poorly. I think of these as social shark attacks. You know, like uh, one thing that I experience a lot is I'll be getting ready to give a talk or go to a party or even just visit with an old friend, somebody who I know is great. And I, I again, feel like, hey, this will, this will be really fun. But I keep on having these intrusive thoughts about, well, what if everybody hates me? <laughs> or <laughs> what if what if this conversation is awful and awkward? And I think of that as similar to shark attacks because shark attacks, as you know, are exceedingly rare, but people nonetheless are terrified of them. And it turns out that bad conversations are sort of like that. Most conversations are pretty good. But if you ask people to imagine what those conversations will be like, they think that they'll be much more awkward, less connected and less positive than they really are. So just like shark attacks, we fear them. And even though they're very unlikely to happen. So in that, it seems like the negativity is, is self-judgment. So I'm going to do poorly. I'm going to make it awkward. They're not going to like me. And in cynicism, the negativity is towards others. That's actually a really good way of putting it. I would say that the two can mix together a lot as well. You know, you can think, gosh, this party is going to be terrible because nobody's going to want, want to talk to me because they're all so obsessed with themselves. You know, you can... <laughs> so there's a way that that cynicism and and I suppose doubts about ourselves really can uh, turn into this vicious cycle that pulls us out of connection and conversation. I think we've all encountered a cynic, but I'd love to get the definition scientifically of what cynicism is, looks like, feels like. Yeah. Cynicism, the way I think about it is it's a theory about people. It's the theory that people are selfish, greedy, and dishonest. Uh, it was first really brought into the world of psychology, scientific psychology, by two researchers, uh, Walter Cook and Donald Medley. They wanted to come up with a test for teachers to see which teachers would get along with their students and which ones wouldn't. So they asked teachers to answer, to say whether they agreed with 50 different statements, like most people will get away with anything if you let them, um, or people only care about you because they want to seem friendly. And it turned out that the more of these statements that teachers agreed with, the worse that their relationships with their students were. But it wasn't just teachers, it was all of us. If you agreed with these statements, you tended to be a kind of prickly, unfriendly, and judgmental individual. Uh, and that's how we think of cynicism now. You know, just like other theories, cynicism changes what we do, right? The theory of gravity, the idea that if you 
you know, if you jump from a high place, you'll fall quickly, stops us from trying to leap tall, leap off tall buildings and fly, right? Because we, we know that gravity is there. Cynicism, the idea that people are selfish, stops us from doing other things, like putting faith in them or trusting them, right? Every time you trust somebody, you're vulnerable to them. And cynics think that that vulnerability is for suckers. So they tend to trust people less. And then, of course, people reflect that back to you. So they're distrusting of you. So it's a trap, right? It, it is a behavior that we have towards others based on a view of how others are going to act. And then in return, we see them act exactly that way because of the actions that we're putting forward. That's so well put. I, I know on the, on the show you've talked before about confirmation bias, right? The idea that when you think something, you when you believe something, you start sort of thinking like a lawyer and looking for evidence that supports your claim and maybe ignoring evidence that doesn't. Cynics are like that too. There was a famous study where cynics and non-cynics looked at a, at, at a video of two people uh, talking, one talking about their problems, the other person comforting the first. And non-cynics thought the person who was listening was really warm and empathic. And cynics thought that they were really cold and maybe that they were bored, that they had ulterior motives for being there. And when you think in that way, as you're beautifully putting it, you act in a way that's judgmental, or maybe you seem really skittish around others. And as you're also saying, other people reflect that right back to you. We reciprocate other people's trust, and we retaliate when other people treat us poorly. So cynics end up creating evidence for their own beliefs and not realizing that they're the ones generating that evidence. And I think an important part of this is recognizing that those thoughts, although we may feel they're internal, are nonverbal reactions, the choice of words that we use in our communication can really showcase that cynicism more openly than we might believe. So in our training program on the first day, we actually film our clients talking to our coaches. And then we show them back the video and first with no audio, just looking at what is their body language. And the clients that tend to be the most cynical coming into the program don't realize that they're not smiling, they're not showcasing any interest in the commu the conversation that's happening in front of them. And of course, that person who's communicating with them starts to then reflect back that disinterest, that awkwardness, and not want to be there. And those that are introverted but not cynical, they can still have that warmth even though there's discomfort going on, but there isn't this belief that the other person is thinking about them negatively or viewing them in a way that doesn't want to communicate with them. So it's really interesting how we often think those beliefs that we have internally are actually influencing more of our communication, nonverbal and verbal, than we realize. Well, I love that you do that. That's such a great way to bring people into self-awareness. And I completely agree. You know, we we have this, I think a lot of us walk around with this uh, belief that we passively receive the world, that we're just observing other people and events and, and things happening. In fact, we act on the world even when we don't know we're doing it. We are really present and influential, and we create in many important ways the social world that we inhabit. And I think that what what you're getting at through this really helpful exercise with your with your clients is that we need to be aware of that power that we have in shaping the conversations that we have, the relationships that we have. And I think that overcoming cynicism as a, one of the first steps towards doing so is embracing and understanding that power and saying, hey, it's not just me responding to a bunch of jerks all over me, all, all around me in, in the world. I have power to change who people are and how they treat me by, by changing how I treat them first. Yeah, it's such a powerful mindset shift to recognize that and then to act on it in ways that influence the way people behave around you. Now, I know for a lot of our listeners, they might be curious to know what is sort of the relationship between skepticism and cynicism? Because it feels like we can be skeptical, maybe not cynical. Uh, what's going on there and, and how do the two relate to each other? That is such a great question, um, and, and I think it's really important because definitions in this space can be really confusing. And sometimes when I tell people, hey, you know, cynicism isn't really that helpful, they say, well, sorry, I'm not just going to believe everything that people tell me. They think that the opposite of cynicism is gullibility, 
or being naive, being a chump, a mark, a rube, basically. And, right. and if that's your only alternative, well, gosh, I can understand why you would go for cynicism <laughs> instead. <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's not your only other option. And in fact, I would say that being really gullible and being really cynical are actually more similar than cynics would like to admit, right? Because both gullible people and cynics are pretty credulous, right? They they are they they rely on their assumptions. A gullible person will think that people can be trusted and will keep on believing that even after they, you know, take him for a ride. A, a cynical person will think that people cannot be trusted and will continue to believe that even if somebody treats them really well. You know, the the, the opposite of both of those is to be a skeptic. Skepticism is, you can think of it as a scientific mindset instead of a lawyerly mindset, right? It's, it's this hunger for more information. It's a desire to not believe things unless you have evidence for them. And in that way, skepticism and cynicism really couldn't be more different. Research finds that people's levels of skepticism are pretty much uncorrelated with their levels of cynicism. So you can be somebody who's looking for more information, evaluating the evidence, thinking like a scientist and be pretty cynical too, or you can be that way and be very trusting. So I think it's important to remember that, you know, whereas cynicism is a lack of faith in people, skepticism is a lack of faith in our assumptions. And that second mindset can be really sharp, right? It doesn't mean taking every everything that people say at their word. It doesn't mean sending your bank account information to the prince who wants to give you $15 million over email, right? It, it's, it's rather being open to the world and ready to learn from it and from other people. Now, I'm curious with this cynicism, do you find scientifically that it's contagious? Um, can groups become more cynical over time? What are sort of the forces going on behind the scenes that might be influencing our cynicism? Yeah, absolutely. It can be contagious. I, I mean, one macro piece of example for that is that cynicism has been catching like a, you know, like a plague uh, across our culture over the last 50 years. In 1972, about 50% of Americans believed most people can be trusted. By 2018, that had fallen to about a third. The size of that drop is comparable to the fall in the stock market during the 2008 financial collapse. So we're really going through a collective trust deficit, which speaks to the contagion that you're talking about. There are two levels at which people have studied that contagion at a more fine-grained level. One is within one-on-one -on -one interactions and relationships. And this gets back to the point you were making about these self-fulfilling prophecies. So there's lots of evidence in studies from economics and soci sociology and psychology that when one person is cynical, they treat other people in ways that telegraph that cynicism. As you said, we're not as good at hiding it as we might <laughs> think we are, right? right? And when other people see that we're treating them cynically, they in turn trust us less. They start to act in ways that are more selfish. So that's one micro level of contagion. And then there's a middle level of contagion, which happens a lot in organizations and communities. And that's especially when leaders are cynical. So if a CEO is really cynical, they'll institute practices that, are, that, that really display a low level of trust and low level of faith in the people in their organization. For instance, micromanaging them or monitoring them. One example of this during the pandemic, millions of people started working remotely for the first time. And their bosses could have said, okay, well, great, try to get your work done. We're living in a, a generational levels of chaos right now. Just do what you can and, and come back to me when you've, when you've finished your work. Um, and have been flexible and trusting. But instead, a lot of companies installed spyware on their employees' computers to like make sure that their their faces were on camera or their mouses were moving. And that type of organizational cynicism from leaders quickly spreads through all of their employees. So employees who are treated this way will will really start to reflect that lack of trust back to their bosses and to their colleagues as well. So that's the sort of middle level at which we see a lot of contagion of cynicism. In that environment where the leadership is cynical, there's this lack of psychological safety that 
creates incentives to behave in ways that further the cynicism. So if you're feeling like you're being judged harshly, it's easier for you then to point out other people's failings and judge them harshly, throwing each other under the bus and not actually collectively working towards the goal. But in those situations, it can be very hard to fight that culturally when you feel from the top that the cynicism is emanating through spyware and the way that they're running meetings or the way that they're hiring and firing people. So what can we do in that situation where we find ourselves immersed in an environment where the leader is cynical, we ourselves might be skeptical, not cynical, and want to be optimistic? Gosh, it's a really hard situation for a lot of people. And I've talked with so many folks who are in that exact situation. They don't want to be cynical, but they feel as though the environment that they're in at work is forcing it out of them, turning them into a version of themselves that they don't want to be. I think there's a many ways that you can respond to that. One is to focus on your organizational backyard or your social microclimate, right? I mean, you may not be able to change a thousand person or a 10,000 person organization if the CEO is really cynical, but maybe you can have conversations with your team, right? If you're a middle manager, for instance, or uh, just with your colleagues, if, you, if you're an individual contributor, the people who you work most closely with and say, hey, let's make a pact. Let's be on the same side here. Let's work towards common goals as opposed to you know, backstabbing or doubting one another. And one way that you can accelerate that process is by leading through example, right? As we've talked about, people retaliate against cynicism. If you treat people badly, they'll treat you badly. You can be the first mover towards the other side of that equation, right? By saying, hey, maybe we can do better here. And then acting in ways where you take leaps of faith on people, where you show up for them. It's it's a risk, of course, right? I mean, there's the risk that you go out on a limb and people break it behind you and you tumble to the ground. But that's the type of risk that you might have to take to see if you can turn a vicious cycle into a virtuous one. The upside of all this, though, is that if you can, in your own team, in a larger organization, work cooperatively, even amidst a competitive and cynical organization, you're going to win at a bottom line level as well. The secret here is that cynicism doesn't just feel bad. It also does poorly in terms of teams' productivity, their efficiency and creativity. So if you can create a, a, an island of anti-cynicism in a cynical sea, you will actually perform better uh, than people who can't. And I think it's important to note, I was talking with an executive coaching client of ours, and, and she was in that very similar situation where effort here is actually more important at the beginning than outcome recognizing that maybe you don't have as much power to change the forces above you, and maybe your team would love you to really shift the outcomes, but just you putting in the effort and showcasing to your team and your peers that this is the values that you're bringing and this is what you're putting forward in your communication and transparency, even if the outcome doesn't shift as much as your team would like, they're going to follow your lead based on the effort that you're putting in to establish this optimism on the team, this cooperativity that ultimately allows them to start to feel safe working with you. Oftentimes, if we're in a situation where we feel powerless and we feel that our manager is not acting at all on what we would love to see happen, then of course, we're not going to want to be productive. We're going to be looking elsewhere for jobs and ultimately we're going to get nowhere near the outcome. And it, it takes a lot of effort, but over time, the more people that you have coming together in this cooperative, impactful way, the more power you have ultimately in that environment. So I know very often we'll hear from clients who are frustrated around the politics at work and not recognizing how much agency they have in impacting those politics. It's easier to complain or to recognize the politics. And as we talked about before, we have a cognitive bias about how much we really have an impact in our own behaviors and actions around the politics around us. Yeah, that's really brilliantly put. And, you know, first, I, I want to validate people who, who are complaining about this. I mean, these struggles are real. Being part of an organization where your CEO is really cynical is painful. And I don't blame people for being upset by that at all. But the question is, where do we go from here? 
as you're saying, one option is just find work elsewhere. And cynical organizations do tend to shed more people quickly and have greater turnover than less cynical organizations. But if you're not going to do that, then as you're saying, another take on this, maybe a more hopeful take is to say, well, what do I have power over? It's almost like that stoic philosophy as well of, hey, there are things that I can't control and there are things that I can. So what's in that second bucket and how can I be a leader? Not maybe company-wide, but at least with the people directly next to me. And as you're saying, part of it is embracing our own power. In our research, my student Eric Neumann and I, we gave people a sense of their power. We taught some people, but not others, that if you trust others, they're more likely to become trustworthy, right? That if you take that leap of faith, other people are more likely to earn your trust because they see that you see the best in them and they want to live up to that positive expectation. When we taught people that versus people who we didn't teach that to, those people were more willing to trust others with money and in conversation. And when people were more trusting, both with money and in conversation, guess what happened? Other people actually did become more trustworthy. So I think that you're exactly right that this is a great space. Workplaces are a great space in which to understand, embrace, and own our own influence over other people and try to use that as a force for good. Now, recognizing that it is contagious, how can we self-diagnose or recognize that we might be moving from skepticism to cynicism? What are the telltale signs? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that there's a couple of places that I would go with that. One is, what are your instinctual responses to other people? When somebody says something kind to you, do you accept that compliment? Do you feel good? Or do you start to feel suspicious? When you think about why somebody is doing something, do you start with the assumption that they're doing it for themselves? Or do you maybe believe that they're doing it for others? So I would say interrogating our own reactions to other people is a good place to start. But hey, that could be skepticism too. It could be that you think somebody's selfish because they've acted selfishly the entire time you've known them. That's evidence-based. A second step that you might take is saying, well, my reactions to people are kind of negative. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of suspecting them. I'm doubting them. What evidence do I have? And to test your beliefs against the evidence you have. So if you're saying, wow, this person said something nice, but I bet they're just trying to get on my good side. They're buttering me up because they're going to ask me for a favor. If you then hit the pause button and say, well, what evidence am I basing that claim on? And your response is, actually, I've never met this person in my life. I have no idea why I th <laughs> I'm thinking this. It just feels right. Then that's evidence that you might be shifting from skepticism to cynicism. So I would say the two-step internal audit would be, one, am I defaulting to a negative view of people? And two, am I doing that in the absence of compelling evidence? If that's the case, then that sounds more like cynicism. And maybe it could be something that, that's worth working on. Now, with this rise in cynicism, are there demographic shifts that are happening? Are there parts of the U.S.? Uh, are there age groups, generations? Are there shifts where it's happening more frequently in your observation around cynicism? Or is it basically generalized across the population? It's both. So within Almost every demographic you can measure, cynicism is on the rise. Um, so there's not really demographics that are very safe from this trend, but there are demographics that are being more impacted. AJ, if I might, might I ask you to guess, if, if you had to hazard a guess, what group of people, what demographic do you think would be rising in terms of cynicism just based on your intuitions? Yeah, you know, it, it's curious, as I was sharing with a, a close friend of mine that I was doing this interview about cynicism, uh, he remarked that he had noticed since I relocated from the Midwest to, to L.A., Los Angeles, that there had been a rise in some cynical behavior in myself and the way that I describe driving in traffic and the way that I describe <laughs> people. And I thought it was really interesting. I, I haven't been back to the Midwest as much as I would like, but 
Um, it just made me think, huh, is there, you know, a shift in larger cities where we're closer on top of each other? Has there been a shift around the pandemic and coming out of that isolation? Um, so instinctually, I would say larger cities and, and the pandemic definitely having a, a forcing function on the way we interact with each other and coming out of the isolation. But curious to see what the research says. Yeah, that's a really interesting intuition. And as far as I know, the data haven't been broken down by urban versus rural versus suburban settings. But that's that I actually share your intuition. And I think that well, just as a person who lives in a big city and deals with traffic a lot, there's no better cynicism factory than a traffic jam, for sure. <laughs> um, I think that the pandemic certainly also had a really uh, detrimental effect on our on our faith in others, while ironically increasing people's kindness. I asked a thousand Americans recently, what do you think the pandemic did to human kindness? And more than half of them, by a lot, thought that it had decreased human kindness. But the data suggests that actually people volunteered more, donated more to charity, and helped strangers much more during the pandemic than they did in the years before. So it's interesting. The pandemic made us kinder and also made us doubt our kindness more, uh, It's uh, ironically. But from a demographic perspective, the biggest trend that we see is actually generational. So younger people are the most cynical. And in fact, a, a survey that came out a few years ago found that among uh, 12th graders, so people who were just entering adulthood, less than 20% believed that most people can be trusted. So it's, you know, basically Generation Z is the least trusting on record in the United States, which to me is very troubling because if younger people who are coming up and are going to be entering leadership and guiding our culture in the decades to come, if they're more cynical than anybody else, I, I, I really worry about that uh, in terms of our shared future. My sister-in-law is Gen Z, and what I've recognized in my interactions with her is the decline of nuance and the rise of short form. So I love the podcast because we can get into the data, we can talk about all these edge cases and really are not only share our own experience, but then look at trends. But oftentimes, the media that we're consuming influences us far more than we recognize. And we've talked about the rise of social media. You know, that generation lives on social media more than anyone else. They're consuming content that is short and punchy and attention grabbing. And this negativity bias is the easiest way to grab someone's attention. And I, I saw a recent chart on, on Twitter about just sentiment in the news and its decline, basically mirroring what you were saying, the decline in, in optimism and the rise in cynicism here in the U.S., starting around the 70s, where headlines and any consumption of the media is overwhelmingly negative. And then you break that down into bite-sized pieces where we're viewing just very, very small nuggets and headlines, not even getting into the nuance of what's going on behind the scenes that could be causing this. And I'm not surprised to, to see that generational shift towards a rise in cynicism at the Gen Z level. I, you know, it's, it's a great insight. And we talk so much these days about the effect that social media is having on young people's mental health, their sense of themselves. I think we talk a lot less but it's but should talk more about what it's doing to their sense about other people and their faith in humanity more generally. So there's this really and you 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 insightfully call this negativity bias. That's exactly what psychologists call it. We do as a species tend to focus more on negative information than positive information. And you can see right why that would be a good idea from an evolutionary perspective, right? I mean, it's safe to ignore a sunset it's not safe to ignore a tsunami, right? I mean, we, we we are oriented towards threat for very good reason, but the media ecosystem and industry and what's often called these days the outrage industrial complex really takes that to another level, basically feeding this, this tendency that we have and accelerating it to a, to a degree that's probably unprecedented in history. There's a name for this called mean world syndrome. And the idea is that the more media that people consume, the worse they think people are, the more dangerous they think people are. There was an incredible version of this when, you know, when I was growing up in the 1980s and 90s, a million years ago, there were 
there was this big scare about kidnapping. You know, I don't know if you remember this, but you would get milk and on the back of a milk carton, there would be pictures of kids who had been kidnapped. And there was all these stories about kidnapping in the news. And at some point in the 1980s, there was a survey where people were asked, how many children do you think are kidnapped in the United States each year? And people thought that 50,000 children a year were being kidnapped. That's in, it's insane. The, the actual number was less than 100. So people had an estimate of kidnapping that was hundreds of times higher than it really was. Now, of course, any kidnapping is a tragic occurrence and deserves to be covered in the news, one could argue. But the coverage was warping people's view of what the world was like in this incredibly systematic and extreme way. And I think now on social media, we see that even more because, as you say, it's these 30-second black and white, just bits of information decontextualized that can just push our buttons and do in a way that, you know, again, make us feel bad about ourselves, but also convince us the world is this mean and horrible place. Well, the book is hope, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I do want to spend the last bit of time here at least becoming hopeful or helping those in our audience who felt all of these pressures, both at work and in the media. We've talked about this in, on past shows as well, influencing us and recognizing that we don't want to be cynical, understanding the health impacts it has to isolate ourselves, to view and distrust others, and to shy away from social interaction. So how can we instill hope in our audience and where are you basing your hope in? Oh, wow. Those are, those are great questions. Uh, I, as I said, embarked on this journey for, for the book because I was feeling really cynical during the pandemic. And the more I explored cynicism, the more I realized that we really don't like feeling it. It's not a fun way to feel. As you said, it's terrible for our health. It's terrible for our relationships. It's terrible for our workplaces. And I would say it's terrible for if I may, even our democracy, when we stop having faith that our culture and society can function. And I think yet we still think we need it. We think that cynicism will make us smarter. We think that it, it will make us safer. And we think that it's moral. The more that I read, the more I realized that that's, none of those things are true either. And, and, and I know... Uh, that sounds even less hopeful. <laughs> We've, we're addicted to this way of thinking that's awful. But I think that, that, that in this case, knowledge can be power because at the same time as we glamorize cynicism way more than we should or have to, we think that hope is silly or naive or toxic even, but it's not the data on hope are very hopeful. <laughs> it turns out that, and so let's define hope first of all, because I want to differentiate it from optimism. Optimism is the idea that things will go well. And it might be putting on rose colored glasses, ignoring our problems, sticking our head in the sand. All of those I think are fair critiques of optimism. Hope is not the same. Hope is the idea that things could go better and that we have agency in improving how things turn out. You see the difference between those, right? One leads to one can lead to complacency. The other is really action-oriented. And it turns out that this feeling of hope, if cynicism is one of the worst things for our health, hope is one of the best because it gives us a sense of empowerment and allows us to still challenge and look at real problems in our lives and in the world not look away from them, but but feel like, well, what can I do here? The same way we were talking about doing that in the workplace, we can do that in the rest of our lives. So it turns out that when we can tap into hope, we A, feel a lot more mentally healthier, physically healthier, more resilient in the face of difficulties, and more willing to challenge the status quo and to take action that makes positive change. Again, at the level of our relationships, at the level of our organizations, and even things like social movements and, and fighting for causes that we believe in. I know what I love about the book is there's personal experience yourself making changes to combat the cynicism you are feeling. I'd love to share a few of those ways that our audience can start to beat back their own cynicism. And I'm also very curious how we deal with those in our life in relationships we want to keep where we're recognizing that they're becoming cynical. So we've touched on 
how contagious it is. We may have family members. We may have close friends who have been influenced by media, influenced by certain situations, catastrophes in their own life that have led to a rise in cynicism. And, and how do we also deal with that in the relationships that we want to keep? I think it's so important. And there's a number of steps that we can take. Maybe I can start, AJ, with what we can do for ourselves to cultivate hope. And then we can talk about how we can bring that to the people in our lives that we care about. So when focusing on ourselves, the two steps that I've been trying to take, and you asked what brings me hope, and I say the science of hope brings me some hope, but it's not enough to just read papers, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's my nerdy way of spending time, but you have to, you have to act differently. So I think that the, the steps that I take are one, think differently, and two, act differently. So thinking differently involves some of what we've already talked about, being skeptical of our cynicism, asking what evidence am I basing my views on? And also being simply aware that, hey, my mind and the human mind in general are kind of prone to focus on the negative. So maybe if I'm thinking negatively, just doubting that, kind of fact-checking those feelings. That's uh, sort of step one in building another mindset. Step two is what we've also been talking about, understanding and embracing our power and saying, well, the way that I act is going to change what other people do. So once we can adopt those, that mindset, we can start to test it out in our real lives. So two ways of doing that. One is to what I call trust loudly, right? So that means giving people your faith, taking a chance on them, but not just doing it, telling them, hey, you know what? I'm going to be vulnerable here. I'm going to tell you something that I'm struggling with. I'm going to give you a new assignment at work that that is kind of difficult or I'm going to, you know, I'm I'm going to go ahead and and loan you this money, but I'm doing it because I believe in you. I really think that you will step up here. When you trust loudly, when you show other people your trust and when you're explicit about it, that reciprocity is supercharged. The likelihood that they'll come back and actually want to earn that trust increases. So trusting loudly is one behavior that I try to engage in a lot. And then the other is collecting more social data. I told you about social shark attacks earlier and and how, <laughs> how neurotic I am about connecting with people. And this was even worse coming out of the pandemic. So on a business trip that I was taking to North Carolina, I decided every chance I have to talk with a stranger, I'm going to take it. And I was terrified that this was going to crash and burn. But I said, before I do it, let me write what my predictions are. So I wrote down what how I thought the average interaction would go on a scale of one to 10, one very negative to 10, very positive. And then I had eight conversations with strangers over a two-day span, and I tested my real experiences against my expectations. And over and over again, I found that people and these, and these conversations were so much more pleasant than I had realized. And that collection of new data, again, thinking like a scientist and then acting like a scientist has been so helpful for me because if you're like most people, which I think I am, my assumptions are too negative. And if that's true of you, then when you collect new data, pleasant surprises will be everywhere. People will turn out to be better than you think. So those two steps have helped me a lot. And, you know, I offer them to readers in the hopes that they can help them too. Yeah, I know our X Factor Accelerator members, as they go through the program, get missions that bring them out of their comfort zone. And it's fascinating to watch them, literally their demeanor and their energy changes as they move through the program, as they start to beat back some of those negative assumptions they had around how interactions would go. Would this communication strategy work with the stranger? Would someone actually want to build trust, skip over small talk, go deep in an immediate conversation? Yeah. And recognizing that once you start to realize all these negative walls and limiting beliefs you put on socializing have isolated you and how much control you have in it, it becomes exciting then to go out with an encounter accounting mission and look yes. for all the opportunities you have to socialize. Exactly, yeah. What I'm concerned about, and I know some in our audience have now had corrosion or distrust rise in their relationship with science through the pandemic. 
And, you know, talking about science, people all over the spectrum on their views around science. As someone who studied science in undergrad and grad school, what I saw during the pandemic was just science being science, recognizing that we're, we're seeking the truth. There's mistakes along the way. We're gathering data around a new event and trying our best to make sense of it. But there was going to be mistakes and mishaps. And hearing your view of science for our audience who are skeptical or maybe even cynical about science, how should they view data collection and the way that they look at what they're experiencing, but then also what science is sharing with them around their cynicism. You know, science, I think, was trusted maybe almost too much at one point um, by the public. There was a sense that whatever a scientist said was, that was it, it's carved in stone, and science is basically a set of facts that are eternal. And that's never how scientists ourselves have viewed it. But I think that in bringing scientific insights to the public, they're too often brought to this black and white place, like you were talking about, where it's just true or it's just untrue. And if the idea is that a scientific finding needs to be true forever, then any time that that finding turns out to be revised or not replicated, we can lose all faith in the scientific system. I try to be really upfront with readers that science is a living thing. It is a process of testing, hypothesizing, revising, being wrong, and then trying to be a little bit less wrong over the years. And so I think that viewed in that way, we have more skepticism about each scientific finding, but maybe less cynicism if one finding turns out to be uh, not replicated or if it turns out to be wrong later on. And in, in my book and in every book that I write, I actually uh, have an appendix called Evaluating the Evidence, where I have another scientist read all the big claims in my book and then do an analysis of their own to say, how reliable are these claims? And I offer readers a chance, hey, look through the data that I've seen, and here's how confident I am in each of the claims that I made. And some of them are based on decades of evidence. Some of them are based on exciting new science. But it's going to be a while before we're really secure in this. So take those with a grain of salt. And I try to write in a way that makes that clear. I'll say, wow, this is really exciting, but it's new. We're going to need more research before we know. So I think that my move towards this has always just been transparency. I think if people, if the public thought of science the way that we think of science, they would be more skeptical and less cynical. And maybe skepticism here is a good thing. I love that. Thank you so much for stopping by and and sharing hope for cynics, as well as your own personal experiences, as I know many in our audience, myself included, have shared them over the course of coming out of this pandemic, certainly. Where can our audience find out more about the science that you do and your book? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty easy to find. So my lab at Stanford is the Stanford Social Neuroscience Lab, and that's where you can find all of our empirical work. Um, And then my new book, Hope for Cynics, is available wherever you can find them. Uh, and yeah, th- those would be the two places I would, I would point people. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much. This was really fun.